you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, if you'll find your way over to Daniel, chapter 1, and uh, we're going to be looking at the first uh, 21 verses there. So don't get scared. That doesn't mean I got 21 points. So I just, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it would be easy to get 21 points out of this scripture this morning. There's so much good stuff here. So if you would look at uh, Daniel, starting in chapter 1 and beginning in verse 1. God wor God's word reads, In the third year of the reign of Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Asaphanas, the master of his, of his eunuchs, to bring some of the church of Israel and some of the descendants of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men into whom there was no blemish but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language of literature of Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time that they might serve before the king. Now, from among these of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them the king of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and Hananiah he gave Shadrach to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portions of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear, my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he so for why should he see your faces worse than the young men are among or uh, men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who ate the portions of the king's delicacies and see, uh, and, and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this manner and tested them ten days. Verse 15 And at the end of ten days their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who had ate the portions of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portions of delicacies and the wine and they, uh, that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better 
than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all of his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. I, I worked on some of those words all week trying to make sure I got them right. And you know, when I got to them, I still had a little bit of problem with them, but the good Lord knows who they are. So, um, you know, in the, in the early part of this century, there was an American ship that wrecked off the, off the coast of England. And uh, on the day that that ship wrecked, it was a calm day. The sea was calm. The weather was clear. Uh, there were no uh, obvious things that would have that would have pointed to to this uh, ship being in peril or, 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 or actually crashing or, or, or wrecking and, and being sunk. But little did the crew know, or did the captain know, that while they were going along and the sun was shining and the wind was calm, that there was a, a undercurrent, a deep current below uh, below the surface of the water. And, and all along, it was, it was pulling the ship off course just a, a little bit at a time. Not, not a huge difference, not big waves slamming it and pushing it and the wind blowing it, but this undercurrent that was at the bottom, at the, at the keel of the ship, and it was pulling it all the time, just subtly over and over and closer to the rocks. And, and before the crew even realized what had happened, the ship was on the rocks and, and they were shipwrecked. You know, in our lives, spiritual drifting is usually a slow and it's an imperceptible uh, process. You know, when, when, we, when we drift, when, when we're pulled, uh, a lot of times it's the, it's the little bitty things. It's not the stuff we see on the top. It's the, it's the stuff, it's that undercurrent. It's that, it's that thing that we don't see that pulls and, and moves us and it, and it gets us off our course. You know, in life, powerful currents of compromise can catch our souls and, and they can cause us to, to crash into the rocks of this world. They can cause us to be shipwrecked. And we know this has happened in our lives when we have lost the strong resistance to evil and to the passion and desire in our lives for the truth that we once knew. We've known it, but, but somehow or another the world is sort of the undercurrent that current that low, lies below the surface has, has sort of pulled us away, little by little, suddenly, away from the truth, and, and all of a sudden we find ourselves shipwrecked on the rocks of this world. So compromise, it causes us to compromise is what it does. We, we, really, we really don't start out intending for this to be a big thing. It's, it's little bitty subtle things that happen in our lives. So what is, what is compromise? What, what, what does compromise mean? Uh, compromise is defined as a settlement of differences by mutual concessions. A settlement of differences by mutual concessions. An agreement reached by adjustment of conflicting or opposing claims or principles. Reciprocal modification, modification of demands that, that we... We, we don't agree with some things, but we sort of try to talk through them, and, 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 and uh, we're going to find some, maybe some middle ground, I think, is, it would be a way to see. The result, uh, the result of this is a, is a settlement. We settle. We settle for less than what God intended us to have. We settle for less than what God wants us to have. Something intermediate between different things. We decide that we'll meet in the middle. But you know, God says, hey, I, 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 don't, I don't settle for meeting in the middle. I, I gave you a road. It, it's a good road. It's a solid road. It's a, it's, a, it's a straight road. It may be a narrow road, but it's my road. He says, I don't call you to meet in the middle. He says, I want you to meet me where I am at. Often our lives are filled with compromise, and we are given a choice as to how we'll live our lives and, and, and the path that we will take uh, through this journey of our lives. And we come to these times of decision, and it's imperative that we make godly choices. Because the choices that we make at the crossroads of life will determine our usefulness for God and, and our effectiveness in the kingdom work. You see, our 
text today is about four men who came to a time of decision in their lives. And you see, they could have either compromised and they could have, as we like to say, just go with the flow. Or they could stand their ground and live and honor the Lord. You see, the circumstances that they faced that day, the circumstances they faced and the decisions that they made set the course for the rest of their lives. That day, that day, Since that happened for those men that day, since this incident occurred, the names of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego have stood tall as the names of, of great heroes of the faith. Because of what they did right now, right then, and right, right at that time. And how about Daniel? How about Daniel? Can you imagine if Daniel had compromised on that day? If he had just went along to get along on that day, uh, we probably would not have the book of Daniel to read from. We would not have the inspiration of, of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego or Daniel to, to look to, to stand on. When we get to those crossroads in our lives to make decisions, we wouldn't have the, the blessing of knowing these good men. The name Daniel to the modern man would have, we, we would never have, uh, we would never have, would have known the blessings of, of knowing and being able to read about Daniel. So it's good to be able to say that these young men stood their test and as a result, we are blessed this morning. And as you and I go through life, there will always be times, there will always be times where we're going to have to make decisions to go the right way. And when these times come, they, they will come. These times, when these times come, and they will come. And they will come. As, as um, I'm sorry, I lost my place in my notes for a second. So when these times come, and they will certainly come, you'll either decide to go with God despite the cost. You know, a lot of times we do, we sort of weigh that thing out, and we sort of put it on our own personal scale a little bit, sort of try to weigh it out. Uh, we've got a decision to make. We're at a crossroads in our life, and, and if I do this, if I, if I go this way, man, I'll be successful in this world, and the world will know me, and they'll recognize me. And, but if I go this way, it's going to be hard but, but I'll be honoring God in what I'm doing. And we put it on our own little personal private scale and we try to weigh it out in balance. But I'm going to tell you, there's no balance to honoring God. There's nothing that can outweigh honoring God. You know, we can choose to honor God despite the cost or we can choose to compromise. The truth contained in this passage will help us as we face the serious crossroads of life. You see, these Hebrew boys, these young men, and they were young men at this time in their lives. They had they, they faced several problems here. There was a lot going on. Each of these problems had the potential to, to derail, completely uh, put these guys off track of what God's plan was for them in their lives. It would derail them and it would lead them off a, a, to on a spiritual tangent, on a, on a road God never intended them to be on. However, these problems that they faced, uh, they're not a whole lot different than the problems that we face in our lives today, that we face in this world today. These boys, they had, uh, they had been brought up in, a, in, a, in and around Jerusalem, and that's where they came from, that's where they hailed from, and they were constantly reminded of their God and, and the importance of, of their God in their lives. They had that influence of the church. They, they had the priests and the scribes teaching and the prophets were preaching the message of Jehovah. And now all of a sudden, they've been removed from everything that they knew. And they've been taken to a, to a foreign land and, and, and they've been hauled off to this land called Babylon. And here they're surrounded by, by heathens and heathen worship and heathen images and heathen people. 
And it would have been just so easy for them to say, oh, we're in a new land, and if we're going to survive, if we're going to make it, we need to, we need to fit in. We've got to change who we are and what we are and how we do things. And we we just got to fit in. And for the Christian, that danger is just as real for us today in this world that we live in. It's easy to be spiritual in church, and it's, it's, it's easy to be godly around godly people. We separate from the godly influences around us. We're placing ourselves in a dangerous position. You see, these four young men, they had been removed from everything that they knew. All of the godly influences they had been brought up in, all of a sudden, all of that was gone, and it was a dangerous place. It's dangerous any time that we open our lives to the possibility of compromise. It's important that we consistently uh, pay attention to our church attendance, to, to be amongst the, uh, those of like and precious faith. We strengthen, we strengthen each other. We, we encourage each other. We, be, we build each other up. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, there had come a time in the church, in the early church, when, when people had forsaken the time of assembling together. And God warns us about that in his word. And he's still warning us about that in his word today of forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. That's so important. We need that influence uh, on each other, to each other, with each other. It is essential that we surround ourselves with God's people. You know what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33? Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company corrupts good habits. You see, it's easy to compromise and conform with the world when we are away from the influence of, of godliness. When we step away from, when we step outside of church, again, it's, it is easy. It's easy to be all spiritual and everything when we're in church and then we walk out into the world and and, and, and the world just flies right at us and, and it pulls us in a whole other direction. It's easy to compromise and conform to the world. You see, these young men were taught a new language and they were taught new ways of looking at life. And all their lives had been exposed to Jewish wisdom. Now they are being taught the wisdom of Babylon. And they are being exposed to things that they've never been exposed to before. Things are being thrown at them and they'll be taught all kind of new things and it's a dangerous time for them. There's much pressure on these young men. It's a battle really of life and death. And, 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 and the king and all of the king's court and all of the king's <coughs> men and all of the king's subjects, they're, they, they, they're, they're, they're pouring this pressure in on these young men to conform to change, to, to be something that they are not. You know, the same dangers we face as a Christian church and as Christian people today, in this world today. We are constantly being exposed to new ways of thinking and we're being told that our way of looking at the world through the eyes of God in the Bible is, is outdated. Our ways are outdated ways and they're ancient and, and, and we're intolerant and we have no tolerance for the world. And praise God, we have no tolerance for the world. There's a lot of pressure being placed on the Christian community to conform to the world's way of thinking today. We're told that we have to accept homosexuality. We're told that we have to accept social drinking. We're told we have to accept uh, cursing and the language of the day. And we have to accept promiscuous 
uh, sexual activity and we have to accept all these things of the world because the world is sitting there okay so they must be okay and we're saying we're being told that if we don't accept those that we're old fashioned we're outdated we're intolerant but I want you to know this morning that God has not changed his mind about one single thing what he said 4,000 years ago what he said 3,000 years ago what he said 2,000 years ago, it stands today. It has not changed one iota. You know, and it really doesn't matter what the world thinks, what the entire world thinks or stands against. The Word of God is the Word of God. It is sure, it is true, and it is settled, and it is right. Psalms 119 and verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, you, your word is settled in heaven. See, it was settled before it was ever here. It was settled in heaven at the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world was ever laid, God's word was settled in heaven. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Now these young men, they were taken to you a foreign land. Everything that they knew was changing. These four young men had, had lived the, uh, uh, the, the, the life of, 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 of Jewish people. Their dietary laws uh, were handed down by the, by the Lord. And, and now they were faced with new foods and even seeds. And they knew that if they did the things that the king wanted them to do, if they ate the things the king wanted them to eat, and if they, if they drank the things that the king wanted them to drink, that they would be, they would be defiled, they would be made unclean, and, and they didn't want to have anything to do with that. You know, as Christians, we too are faced with choices that they run contrary or opposite to the, to the, uh, to the best that God has proposed for us. They run in opposition to that. The world runs in opposition to, to the things that God knows is best for us. And, you know, we have to make decisions about those things, the, the choices that we make. Everything, the things that we look at, the things that we read, our music, our, our television, just about everything that's out there in the world. We have to make choices about those things. Not all those things are bad. But it's what we do with them and how we use them and, and what we take and do with them. We're confronted daily by choices to either do or not do certain things that cause us to be defiled, that cause us to sin, that cause us to be shipwrecked in this world. Now I want to say this morning that I'm saved and nothing will ever change that. But the choices that I make in my life can build me up or they can, or they can tear me down as a servant of God. And, and that's the same way with all of us. If you're saved and you're bought by the, by the blood of Jesus and you're saved and you know that you're saved, you're saved. But the choices that we make have consequences as to how God can use us in this world and, and what he can do with us. And sometimes those choices cause us to be Set out and put on the sideline for God's work sometimes. We can get ourselves straightened out and, and we can get our hearts right. I, I never, I could never be lost again, but I can become defiled and put on the shelf by God. So they've taken these guys and they, they've taken them away from the land that they knew. They've taken them away from the people that they knew. They, they, they've given them different kind of food to eat. They're, they're not having the same food. And, and now the king comes up and says, in verses 6 and 7, he says, Hey, I'm going to give you some new names now. And when these young men arrive in Babylon, they, they are carried some wonderful God-given names. Each name carried with it a testimony to, to the person of God. Daniel, Daniel, God is my judge. Hananiah. God is gracious. Mishael, God is without equal. As arrived, the Lord is my helper. 
And when they arrive in Babylon, what does, what does the king want to do? The, they, they, they want to give them new names. The king is making every effort he can to wipe out everything there is to know about these guys. Everything that they knew, he wants, to, he wants them to be completely changed and, and influenced in a totally different way. So he gives them new names. He calls, he be, Daniel becomes Belteshazzar, which means Baal will protect. Hananiah becomes Shadrach, which means inspiration of the sun. Mishael becomes uh, Meshach, which means belonging to Aku. Azariah becomes Abednego, which means servant of Nego. You see, Nebuchadnezzar's goal here was to change the identity and hopefully the way that they thought. He wanted to change everything about it. Right down to who they were, what they were. However, it's plain to see if, if we would continue to read in this text this morning, if we would read in Daniel, that, that even though their names were changed, their character remained intact. Man, what a testimony. The world and the devil will try every tactic to force us to fit into its mold. It'll try everything it knows. The devil will pull every trick out of his bag, and that's what they are, they're tricks. They have, they have no authority and no power, but they are tricks, and, and he'll use them. And the world, and the world kind of chimes in with it, and, 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 and they, try to, they try to remove uh, who we are, what we are. I want you to know this morning, if you are saved by the blood of Jesus, you were given a new name, and that name is Redeemed. And nobody, Nothing of this world can take that away from you. Nothing can take that away from you. The world and the devil will try everything it can. But God reminds us that when we face trials and tribulations, when we face testing, that he's going to be there with us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 says, No temptation has taken has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But when the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear. So when we look at the stand of these four men, I think we can certainly find inspiration to stand Let's look at one more real quick thing. The Babylonians had changed. The, these Babylonians had, had captured. They overran the, this. They overran Israel and they captured and, and they brought some back as slaves. The Babylonians they could they could change their homes and they changed their diet, their names, they changed their education, but they could not change their hearts. And these men decided that they were going to serve the Lord. Whatever the cost was, and that's where they stood, they stood on that, and they would not move. It would have been easy to have said, well, it's all right. I guess, you know, we're in a, we're in a new land, and we're in a new country, and, you know, the folks back at home, they're really, you know, they're not going to know what we're doing. And we got, you know, we got to be able to survive. We got to be able to get along. So they could have, they could have easily said, well, you know, we're just, we're just going to, we're just going to go along with, with whatever uh, whatever it takes to get along. Or, or uh, maybe they said, maybe they could have said, we had better do what the king says. Or, or, or maybe, here's, here's, here's my most favorite one. Or maybe, maybe we'll obey the king outwardly and we'll just keep our faith to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. They could have done all of those things. But they chose not to. You see, many of us seem to find it too easy to, to give in to compromise. We need to dedicate ourselves to God and to his plan for our lives. Our duty is to be faithful and to serve the Lord, whatever it takes, wherever we are. We're not told how long Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego served there in Babylon, but we are told that Daniel endured in a place of power and prominence for over 70 years. In fact, he was nearing 90 when he faced the lions. Man. 
you know, this certainly encourages me, and I hope it encourages your heart because it reminds me that no matter how old I am, how long God will let me be here on this earth, wherever he puts me, wherever he takes me, wherever I go in this life, that I will always seek to honor the Lord as Daniel did. That's, that's my prayer is that we, no matter how old God allows us to be, no matter where he puts us at on this world, where he takes us to, that we can always honor God in everything that we do. See, God is always looking for vessels which he can fill up and, and pour out for his glory. There was a giant 400-year-old redwood tree that came crashing down one day in the forest. The tree, from all, uh, for all purposes, looked very healthy. It was a huge, giant tree. And it fell, and, and there would be no reason to explain why this tree would, would have fallen, why, why it would have, have crashed down in the forest. And, and as they came to examine the tree, and they started looking and digging and cutting, when it got to the very inside of the tree, they found this real tiny little insect, a little bee, that had wormed its way in. It had infected the tree, and it started to eat the tree from the inside out. And on the outside, for all purposes, it looked healthy, but it was diseased, and it was being eaten alive from the inside out. I want to ask you this morning, will you look deep inside, and will you do what it takes today draw closer to the Lord to put your place to put yourself in a place that will allow you to honor and, and, and serve him if you're willing to do that then come to the Lord and allow him to have his way with you have his way with you and have his way with your life you know uh, you can see this morning that the Lord's table has been set before us there's some things there that we need to consider as well. You know, he warns us and he tells us not to come to this table. Not to compromise it in any way. Not to do it any different than the way that he's told us to, to do it. To love each other. To cherish each other. To honor each other. And in doing that, we honor him. So now as uh, we have a time to prepare ourselves to come to the Lord's table, we need to look inside. We need to examine ourselves. Where forgiveness is needed, we need to forgive it. Where it needs to be given, we need to, where, where it needs to be given, we need to accept that forgiveness from, from others. We need to give it and we need to accept it, wherever that is. So as we pray this morning together, as we close this morning and before we take the Lord's Supper, as we have a time of invitation. If you're here this morning and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, then I would pray that you would come and just, uh, just deal with that and let Christ deal with you this morning. If you're here this morning and there's some things that you know that you just need to, you need to get right with the Lord about, you need to get right with each other about, I pray this morning that that we would ask for that forgiveness, that we would give that forgiveness. That we would not approach the Lord's table with any compromise in our heart. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this time, and Lord, we ask that, <clears throat> Lord, that you would remind us each and every day of these men, Daniel and Meshach and Shadrach and Abednego, and Father God, even though the, the world tried to change who they were and what they were, Lord, you were, your, your, your faith, uh, their faith in you, Lord, their, their spirit uh, because of you, Lord, was so strong that the world could not move them, the world could not shake them. And, Lord, they stand as great examples of what you would call us to be. So, Father, I pray that, Lord, now as we have this time of invitation, that, Lord, you would just touch our hearts and, and Lord, that you would just uh, speak to us. <coughs> and, Lord, help us to be encouraged by Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, Lord, that uh, we would stand firm on who we are, the redeemed of God, those chosen, uh, Lord, by you. And Father, we just thank you for the privilege and opportunity to come this morning. 
and to share your word and share in this table. And Father, we ask now that you bless this time. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.